Deuteronomy quoted many times in the New Testament, Christ quoting from it a couple of times even when he was talking to Satan during the time of temptation. So what does that say to you? Is when you come to times of temptation, you should be familiar with Deuteronomy. As Christ would say, it's written. Have you read it? Well, we can put a stop to that if you haven't by simply getting into it and reading the love your Father has for you and uh, telling you, how you what you do to go about receiving His love. That's important. If you want to be blessed, do it His way. I guarantee you, you will be blessed. So, a word of wisdom from our Father as they continue moving. Let me place you geographically in case you've missed a lecture or two. We're moving up the eastern side of the uh, Dead Sea, and we're coming up to the land where they will cross over into, say, to Jericho. But we're just uh, south of Mount Nebo now, or adjacent to it, we could say, all right? With that, chapter 7, a word of wisdom from our Father as we're working our way to entering the promised land, which even as we're working our way to enter the millennium, which is our promised land, how fantastic and how fitting for this hour. And chapter 7, verse 1, and it reads, When the Lord thy God, when Yahweh the Elohim, shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, which means the peasant people or village people, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. They, they, were, they were all greater. Here we have seven, and uh, it, the, they are mentioned anywhere from ten to seven enemies of, uh, of God and God's children. Though they be God's children, they didn't worship God. So, therefore, setting themselves up. What are you supposed to gain from that? Please God, and he'll always be pleased with you. Verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Now, um, of course, don't do the, mercy means favors or or uh, or love. Now, there's a reason for it, and it uh, the reason follows. Verse three. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why? For, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now that's, uh, the word destroy probably would be better translated cause you to perish, meaning you're going to fall totally out of his plan. That's not as easily done perhaps as that verse makes it sound because now through the crucifixion, Upon repentance, we have forgiveness. So we must always add that. But you can be turned away from the Word of God so easy if you're not careful, if you don't remain focused. You can think you're listening to some really good information. And quite frankly, if it isn't written, if it isn't part of your Father's letter to you personally, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you were a member of the tribe of the Perizzites. In this generation after the crucifixion, if you believe upon him, you become a child of God. And it's important that you heed the lecture and the truth that he gives you, whereby you don't perish. Now, that sounds strong, but what is the reason of the strong statement, your father doesn't want you to perish? Why? He loves you. So don't take it as a hard statement. Take it as a very uh, a statement from a, a God that appreciates discipline. And if, quite frankly, if you can't discipline yourself, you're going to end up in trouble. That's the way it goes. 
in following this wonderful letter that our Father has written, verse 5. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire, their sculptures and so forth. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do away with that false religion. You're going to destroy the places even where it's practiced. Verse 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, this is a subject and a statement that is a little difficult to be understood. Why did he choose them? It wasn't because they were the greatest. It wasn't because um, of... Um, of the fact that um, they were the prettiest by any means. I'm going to go turn over to Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Listen to this carefully. It's kind of the seedbed of the covenant in that respect. N now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, there's a lot said in that. Everything belongs to the Father. His, I don't know, are you getting your part? If you're a child of his, you are. You will. You shall. Verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. In other words, you will be a holy nation. Why? Because only God is holy. And you will help other nations by setting the example, become holy also. For as it is written through Abraham, meaning, what does Abraham mean? Uh, father of many nations, to be a blessing to all nations, to all people. Why? Why are they a peculiar people? Because Christ will come through this lineage. And that's important. That was the greatest love gift men, God could give to all mankind, the enemies, everyone else. So don't think that God plays favorites without reason. And it's real easy to do that. Why did God just pick them and call them his special people and blessing them? And they earned it, right? Because they did love him. Now, and the fact is that through that, through that, uh, through those genes, you will notice in Exodus verse uh, 19, verse 6, it's stated as priest. Why? Because the high priest of high priest would come through that lineage, meaning Melchizedek, which is to say the son of God. What, what does Melchizedek mean? Melchizedek is king, Zedek of the just, king of peace, king of the just. All right? So um, I covered that because I think some people think that God is a little unfair to some people. He isn't. Verse 7, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because... I will return to chapter 7, verse uh, 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. And if you take the reason being for this back to the original, that is to say, I don't mean manuscripts, but to the first earth age, uh, for the deeper scholar, I'll leave it there. Word is sufficient to the wise. Verse 8, But because the Lord loved you, that's a powerful word. He loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he hath sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the land of, uh, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God takes care of his own. That's a type and an example for you today. If you follow the letter, God will take care of you. He will guide you. He will direct you. Hey, if you don't believe that, then fine. That's no problem. It's your choice. But I assure you it is true. For God doesn't change. 
He is the same yesterday, he is today, and he will be forever. You can always count on that. Verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. There is no other. The faithful God. Faithful meaning what? You can count on him. You can place your faith in him, or you should. Which keepeth covenant. That means he keeps his promises. He keeps his contracts. And mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Do you know that there have not been a thousand generations since the beginning of time? So what does the statement mean? It's a figure of speech that means forever. Now, uh, many people, I suppose, would take that and say, well, that's true. God is just going to just love and keep his people from generation to generation. That isn't what it said. That great, big, that huge word was centered within that verse. That word that says, which keepeth covenant with mercy with them that, not with everybody. He didn't say he would, he would keep that love up and that uh, compassion with everyone. No, with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. I don't know, do you do it today as best you can? No one is perfect, certainly. But he counts trying as sufficient when you repent on your shortcomings. He'll pick you up and he will carry you forth. Our Father is so understanding but you must understand the conditions thereof. Or you're just going to waste your time and be confused because God didn't hear your prayers, so to speak. The word mercy is a beautiful word. And our Father, that many times I just translated as love, his love for you. And um, I suppose that carries well. Verse 10. And repayeth them that hate him to their face. Whoa, that's heavy. To destroy them, to cause them to perish. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. And you'll remember the statement in Malachi and uh, in uh, uh, Romans chapter 9. Uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Why? Because Esau hated him. Hating God pays very poor dividends because this is a promise from your father that he will take it up with you one on one. What chance do you think you have with the creator of all things when he takes you on one on one? Uh, a snowball in hell would have a better chance than you because God doesn't miss. So that's a pretty strong statement. Now, I like the word repayeth. God always pays the dues, all right? And um, he makes sure you get everything you've got coming to you, not necessarily all at one time, thank God for that, but he'll make sure you get what you've got coming to you, whether it's good or bad. So what is the lesson? What, why am I pushing this? Don't ever accuse your God of evil. Don't ever accuse him of placing a burden on you in a complaining way. And keep and do his commandments and love him. That's what he wants from you. I suppose if I were to have to give up many things that I teach, I would never want to give up love, teaching that God wants your love. Loving him covers a multitude of sins that you will commit, especially on repentance, because he wants from you your love. And if you are mature enough that you can understand that and let him know that you love him, you'll be a lot better off. Verse 11, thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them to put them on the shelf, to take God's word and put it on the shelf and keep records in it of deaths and births. No, to keep it and do it. 
do them, not just do one, like love alone, do them all as best you can. Why? They're simple. And most of them are just natural anyway. Verse 12, wherefore it shall come to pass. Now, this is a promise. Here you don't have to say maybe, perhaps. No, it shall come to pass if. There's that huge word again. It's called a condition. If ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them. That is to say that hearken means listen, learn. Keep means to put them in your mind and salt them away there and have them at the ready. And to do them means to be active. It's real in your life. That's one reason why you can say uh, Christianity is not a religion but a reality. Continuing, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant. That's the agreement. This is a covenant within itself, this verse. That he will keep, shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. That was his covenant. Um, um, I, I can't help but break this word mercy down and sit here, and perhaps it would be good for you if you would check it out in your kid. And kid, uh, uh, spelled in the Hebrew, C-H-E-C-E-D. It means to favor, to favor in a loving way. It's very difficult to put this into English because it covers so many bases. It, has, it is such a huge word, God's mercy. Um, uh, to favor, to um, care for, to show compassion toward, um, but, but to, um, in, in each of these uh, verbs, have love affixed to them because our Father is a God of love, not hate. He doesn't go out looking for someone to zap every day. He doesn't want to do that at all. The reason he's taking the time to teach you what it is he wants, knowing, uh, hey, if you cross him, he's going to take it out with you face to face. You can count on it. He will. Especially if you hate him, if you go that far, I feel sorry for you. But to the, the opposite end of that spectrum is to love him. And what does that promise say? He will love you in return. And I mean, now, you know, uh, it doesn't take a very bright child long. Well, now, didn't it say back there that everything belonged to God? Yep, that's what it said. It's all his. And, and, and he's my father? That's right. He's the father of all. Every living thing, he is the father thereof. Well, then that means that my father owns everything. You got it. But what he mainly wants in return, he made a covenant that he'll give it to you. That is to say, his promises will be given to you if you claim them and if you keep, and if you do. But it is kind of like the frosting on the cake, and I, that even falls short of describing the, uh, the word kisid, um, uh, because it's just a, it's a little b word, but it's huge. It just is, the, it is such a loving word that he shows that mercy. It could even be translated as or as the etymology of it would go as unmerited favor, meaning we don't deserve it. But we collect it because of that little word love. You can't con him and you can't fool him. But I hope you understand the power that's entailed within these verses of this very chapter. It's fascinating. Verse 13. And he will love thee and bless thee. Now, don't miss any of this. And multiply thee. Got it? He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, thine oil, 
the increase of thine kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee. And you know, the Christian nations of today export more grain, food, the land of plenty than any other country. It's not an accident. It's blessed of God. And that doesn't take away from any peoples anywhere. But why? We're supposed to be a blessing to them, like, like brothers in that sense. Uh, we're not to let someone take advantage of us. Don't misunderstand. But, hey, um, God is real. All you have to do is look around yourself and see the real truth. Certainly, the house of Israel, when it separated itself from the house of Judah, uh, and God brought it to pass, and God even, he was so put out at our forefathers at one time, the house of Israel I'm speaking of, that he divorced them. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. But he kept his word. And when you pray, he knows. Verse 14, Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male nor female barren among you or among your cattle. Barren has many meanings. We have polluted ourselves to the point there are many problems. But barren means there, there are many ways to produce children. Teaching is one way to do it. They become your spiritual children. And I guarantee you, if you teach God's Word, and if you teach it in the way it should be, you will have more children than you can ever count, spiritually speaking. Blessing after blessing after blessing. As a matter of fact, it, if you become a teacher, it isn't long when you begin to read those blessings and how full your quiver is of how many lives the Word has touched through you, not you doing it. Now, don't misunderstand, but through you, the Word flows that it changes lives. So there, there is nothing barren about truth. Verse 15, And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. Now, this is talking about the plagues of, of Egypt. Well, then many people right away are saying, well, I'll tell you one thing, we have sickness in our family and we do the best uh, we can. You, you don't understand. God himself put them upon Egypt. But people in this generation disobeying God put them upon themselves. They put them upon themselves because they won't follow God's health laws, number one. And even if you decide to follow God's health laws, you're going to have a very difficult time finding healthy food, uh, necessarily, that isn't contaminated in some form or the other. So I, I just want to, you've got to read and understand what you're reading. God didn't say you wouldn't have sickness anymore. He said he wouldn't put it on. So if anybody says God made them sick, they're just mistaken. They did it to themselves or our own stupidity and the way we poison the air, water, and food, what can you expect? But don't blame that gig on God. Verse 16, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for they will be a snare unto thee. Now, many people uh, accuse me of being very hard and teaching very hard. Well, why would I do that? Show no mercy to false teaching. That's satanic. Don't you dare give Satan one little uh, space or he'll move in. You teach the word exactly as it's written, giving on no quarter, and do it boldly. Seventeen. Well, let me let me just take that. Up. Why? Why? Why would you be so hard? Because they're going to be, they're going to seduce your good people if you let them have free reign to to uh, tout blabber, false teachings, traditions of men that make void the word of God. There is no 
excuse whatsoever to be much more than decent to them. May God help them for misleading good people when they teach traditions rather than God's truth. Don't give any quarter. Verse 17. If thou shalt say in thine heart, these nations are more than I, how can I, I want you to notice the big eyes in this, eyes and minds. How can I dispossess them? Well, that, that wasn't the situation. God said, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to give them to you. Then how can the big I get in there? How can I do it? You're not going to. God is. Do you have enemies today? Do you think God doesn't know it? He said, touch not mine anointed. He knows. Now, um, and when one of God's own stands up for their own rights, it's fantastic because God rushes to your aid. Verse 18, Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shall well remember. Do you know what well remember? That's pretty well, that's a pretty good translation. You better thee well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. They better not hanky with God's own, all right? I guarantee you one thing. It doesn't pay to hanky with a teacher or the people that truly teach God's word, that teach his love and his understanding. He will come down on them with the two before beyond measure, 19. The great temptations which thine eyes saw and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm. What does the stretched out arm mean? It means to take your hand and pull you from the mire. It means to take your hand and save your life. It means also to stretch out his hand against your enemies and whack a do them, all right? Whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. What did he do to them? Well, he let them through the water in one instance and then closed it over the enemy. It's pretty hard to swim when you're in an 800-pound chariot with 200 pounds of armor on. I mean, you've got to be a pretty good swimmer to swim out of that one. They didn't, 20. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. Now, many oh, send a hornet. That sounds, I, I can just hear it to some, you know, to, uh, to an atheist and say, that's just silly. Well, no, it isn't. It means he will use, God uses natural ways, and that's why many people are atheists. They don't realize... Well, it was just a coincidence. I wonder, I wonder when um, Deborah was judge, which she would be not long after this writing. Uh, I mean, there wasn't a man to head Israel, so a woman had to. Her name was Deborah. The men wanted to, they, they were being attacked, and Deborah, being the judge, said, you go take them. God told me to tell you to be at this place at this time and take them. They wouldn't go, would not go, except that she would lead them. She would go in front of them. Well, good old Deborah didn't hold back. She led the pack, and God sunk the enemy, gave them the victory. He used a very natural thing. He used mud, not hornets, but that's the point. There would be many people who would say, well, it was sure hard luck for them that it came that big rain burst that day. And there was more reason than that that it came. So therefore, God utilizes his own uh, creation to defeat his, your enemies at times, but don't let that pull your mind away from the fact that God did it. That's why he uses something as simple as a hornet not, I guarantee you, it uh, seems to me that there was once that he did this, but you get, a, you get a nest of hornets after you, and I guarantee you, you'll change locations rapidly. But it will be a natural thing. 
the hornets did it, not God, the atheist would say. Well, God controls. He's in control. Um, did we spend too much time on that? I don't think so. Because I think it's important that you know how God operates at times. 21, that's, and this is not to say that all bad weather is caused by him, okay? Verse 21, thou shalt not be affrighted at them. For the Lord thy God is among you. Underline that in your mind. You're not alone. He is among you. A mighty God. And terrible. That is to say to be feared by your enemies. What that would say to you is, is when one of your enemies, when you're doing God's work, rises up against you, hey, he's in a heap of trouble. Because God is among you. That's why, you could, that's why you don't hear me be shy. That's why I'm not shy about saying there are no giants in this world when it comes to a unit that is doing God's work. We're the giant. Why? God's among us. Verse 22. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little, Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beast of the field increase upon thee. That's it. Be, um, be uh, not over-anxious, little by little. 23. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. In other words, what is God doing? He's taking out the old and bringing in the new way. God deals with people, 24. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. Thou shalt no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them Com uh, completely. That's the way our Father operates. Verse 25, the graven images of their God shall be burned with fire. Now, this is being the reason to get rid of fake religions, false teachers, traditions. And thou shalt not desire the silver nor gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. That is to say... If it's a piece of silver made in the uh, image of Dagon, let's say, that's a god. And it's an abomination for someone to call a chunk of metal God when you have the living father that owns everything. He created that silver that that little thing is made out of. And, of course, what you want to do is remember Achan when they took the victory and he saw that he saw that Babylonian priest robe. Whoo, I mean to tell you, it was fancy. It was pretty. I mean, it made a man look priestly. There's just one problem. It was a Baal priest robe. And old Achan took it and hid it in his tent, and it was called the accursed thing. It's a lesson everyone should learn. 26. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house lest thou be cursed, a cur be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Now, that is to say to literally take some religious thing of Satan's religion and bring it into your home as a trinket. Now, many people then, they go overboard and they start throwing out uh, images, pictures of birds and uh, poor little old robin in the spring, uh, pulling it a worm. You're not going to worship that. And it's not cursed. It's God's nature created. It's what it is the message it delivers. Now, I never speak against other religions. But don't bring the head of some other religion into your house and say, isn't that a pretty little man, you know, chubby and all that kind of stuff, you know, or something of that nature. And I don't want to say any more than that or I'd, be, I'd probably be identifying different religions. Get it out.
You don't need it. But most of all, the danger is that your children might worship or, or accept, especially if you, the danger is in worship of an object, of a, of a fake religion or traditions of men. Or if you attend a church where traditions of men are taught rather than the Word of God, you're in danger. God abhors it. And then many people wonder, well, I wonder why our church is just drying up. Well, I praise God if it's a false house of God, it should dry up, and the quicker the better. Am I judging? No, that's a fact. If God's Word isn't taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse in it, it should dry up because man's words are not important enough to be touted when they have the real thing, God's Word, because God's Word changes lives, blesses people, leads people, strengthens the love between the entity and their father, placing them under the promises of God where they find that our serving our father is a reality and not some weekend religion but daily, daily walk with him. Think about it, beloved.